are many or few saved? In other words, will the majority of humanity be saved or damned? This question was asked of Jesus in Luke 13, starting with verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the householder has risen up and shut the door, you will begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. He will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say to you, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There you will weep and gnash your teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself thrust out, and men will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Jesus further proclaims this in Matthew chapter 22. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And Matthew 7, starting verse 13, says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The majority of early church fathers and saints throughout the centuries have said that the majority of humanity, even the majority of Christians, will be damned. St. Jerome says, Out of 100,000 sinners who continue in sin until death, Scarcely one will be saved. And he also says, Many begin well, but there are few who persevere. St. Alphonsus Liguori says, The greater part of men choose to be damned rather than to love Almighty God. The most common opinion is that the greater part of adults is lost. Some even say the number of the saved is devastatingly low. St. John Vianney. Shall we say all are saved? Shall we all go to heaven? Alas, my children, we do not know at all, but I tremble when I see so many souls lost these days. See, they fall into hell as leaves fall from the tree as it approaches winter. The number of the saved is as few as the number of grapes left after the vineyard pickers have passed. St. Leonard of Port Maurice recounts, One of our brothers, well known for his doctrine and holiness, was preaching in Germany. He represented the ugliness of sin and impurity so forceful that a woman fell dead of sorrow in front of everyone. Then coming back to life, she said, when I was presented before the tribunal of God, 60,000 people arrived at the same time from all parts of the world. Out of that number, three were saved by going to purgatory, and all the rest were damned. St. Vincent Ferrer relates that an archdeacon of Lyon gave up his charge and retreated into a desert place to do penance, and that he died the same day and hour as St. Bernard. After his death, he appeared to his bishop and said to him, No, Monsignor, that at the very hour I passed away, 33,000 people also died. Out of this number, Bernard and myself went up to heaven without delay. Three went to purgatory, and all the others fell into hell. Blessed Anna Maria Taigi says, The greater number of Christians today are damned. The destiny of those dying on one day is that very few, not as many as ten, went straight to heaven Many remained in purgatory, and those cast into hell were as numerous as snowflakes in midwinter. So, the majority of humanity, even Christians, will be damned. Case closed, right? Not so fast. There is a good argument for the opposite view. That is, that the majority of humanity will be saved. I'm not saying that I subscribe to this view, but it is worth taking a look at. The argument goes like this. The terms few and many are subjective. We see many as being the larger number and few being the smaller number, but they don't have to be. For instance, let's say I have 14 eggs and I take away three. I could say that 11 is too few for a dozen 
and three was too many to take away to leave a dozen. And to the God who desires the salvation of all men, and who did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, eleven is too few saved, and three is too many lost. Now this sounds like a clever way to neutralize the seemingly clear yet uncomfortable teaching of Scripture and make it say what we want it to say. And if that was the only thing this side had, I would reject it out of hand. But if we take into account that at the time of Jesus, it was a theological debate as to whether all Jews would be saved or just some, with the understanding that all non-Jews would not be saved. When Jesus was asked, will those who are saved be few, the person was talking about Jews. What Jesus was saying in Luke 13 is that salvation is not just for Jews, but for Gentiles as well. He was warning them that the fact that they were Jews will not save them. So answering the question, will the majority of humanity be lost or saved, was not what Christ was doing. Do you really think Jesus would have answered the question directly? Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And what I find to be the most compelling argument is that in the parables, it's always half to more than half saved. The parable of the ten virgins, five were saved, five were lost. The parable of the talents, two were saved, one was lost. The parable of the lost sheep, 99 were saved, and one was lost. The sower, there's, this is the only possible exception that I've seen, but either one was saved and two were lost, or two saved and one lost. It just depends. The laborers in the field, all were saved. The prodigal son, both sons were saved, none lost. The unforgiving servant, two saved, none lost, but had to go through purgatory. In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The faithful versus the wicked servant, three saved, one lost, but two had to go to purgatory. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not make ready or act according to his will shall receive a severe beating. But he who did not know and did what deserved a beating shall receive a light beating. But what about the saints and early church fathers? While the majority of the early church fathers and saints believed the majority, even the vast majority, were lost, they are not the magisterium. And the magisterium has not spoken on this, nor are they likely to. That's not to say that we can simply dismiss their opinion. But the early church fathers are only considered infallible if they are unanimous on a subject, and they are not unanimous on this. In fact, Origen, St. Clement of Alexandria, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and perhaps even St. Athanasius of Alexandria believed in what's called apocatastasis, which says that while souls may go to hell after they die, even the majority, it is temporary, and that in the end, all will be saved some going so far as to say that even the devil and his angels will be reconciled with God. St. Gregory of Nyssa said, No being created by God will fall outside the kingdom of God, and no being will remain outside the number of saved. St. Jerome originally subscribed to this theory, but later rejected it. And Augustine confirms the belief to have been popular in his day. I must now, I see, enter the list of amicable controversy with those tender-hearted Christians who decline to believe that any or that all of those whom the infallible just judge may pronounce worthy of the punishment of hell shall suffer eternally, and who suppose that they shall be delivered after a fixed term of punishment, longer or shorter, according to the amount of each man's sins. Now this is a universalism, and it is condemned by the church, so it's not true, but I'd say it can safely be said that these early church fathers believed in the majority saved. And we are not obliged to agree with the majority on this. The majority of church fathers and saints believed in a literal interpretation of Genesis, but Catholics are allowed to believe in evolution. And the majority of early church fathers prior to Augustine were premillennialists, which has all but been condemned by the church. And the closest thing to a magisterial statement we have on this subject comes from Pope Benedict XVI in his encyclical titled Space Salvi from paragraphs 45 and 46, 
and these quotes have been edited. There can be people who have totally destroyed their desire for truth and readiness to love, people for whom everything has become a lie. In such people, all would be beyond remedy, and the destruction of good would be irrevocable. This is what we mean by the word hell. On the other hand, there can be people who are utterly pure, completely permeated by God, and thus fully open to their neighbors, people for whom communion with God even now gives direction to their entire being, and whose journey towards God only brings to fulfillment that which they already are. Yet we know from experience that neither case is normal in human life. For the great majority of people, we may suppose, there remains in the depths of their being an ultimate interior openness to truth, to love, to God. However, it is covered over by ever new compromises with evil. What happens to such individuals when they appear before the judge? Will all the impurity they have amassed through life suddenly cease to matter? What else might occur? St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, gives us an idea of the differing impacts of God's judgment according to each person's particular circumstances. In this text, it is in any case evident that our salvation can take different forms, that in order to be saved, we personally have to pass through fire. So, according to Pope Benedict XVI, a few people go straight to heaven, a few go to hell, everyone else goes through purgatory, which means they'll end up in heaven. While this is not infallible or binding in any way, it does carry a fairly high level of authority and at least neutralizes the majority opinion of the saints and fathers. In my opinion, the stories of three or four out of 60,000 saved seems like a scare tactic to me designed to spur people to piety, which was fine during the Middle Ages when no one questioned Christianity, but today it just causes despair. Why bother if you're just going to go to hell anyway? Might as well enjoy yourself. On the other hand, only a few going to hell and everyone else going to heaven, most through purgatory, comes across to me as wishful thinking, regardless of who said it. However, this is as far as a Catholic can go without falling into heresy. And while the parables do show half to more than half saved, they are always shown in the context of servants. That means Christians. And so I believe the majority of Christians will be saved but the majority of non-Christians will not be saved. And since the number of Christians has never been close to half the population of the world, the majority of humanity will not be saved. But we don't know for sure. But since the Catholic Church is the only divinely established means of salvation, we do know that your best chances of being saved is to be Catholic. The 15 promises of the Rosary say, and St. Louis de Montfort confirms, that if you pray the Rosary every day, you will be saved. And that praying the rosary every day is a great sign of predestination. And we also know through private revelation that the salvation of sinners depends on the prayers and sacrifices of Catholics. Our Lady of Fatima said, many souls go to hell because there are none to make sacrifices and pray for them. Our Lord said to St. Faustina, my daughter, help me to save a certain dying sinner. Say the chaplet that I have taught you for him. When I began to say the chaplet, I saw the man dying in the midst of terrible torment and struggle. His guardian angel was defending him, but he was, as it were, powerless against the enormity of his soul's miseries. A multitude of devils was waiting for the soul. But while I was saying the chaplet, I saw Jesus, just as he is depicted in the image. The rays which issued from Jesus' heart enveloped the sick man, and the powers of darkness fled in panic. The sick man peacefully breathed his last. When I came to myself, I understood how very important the chaplet was for the dying. It appeases the anger of God. And according to Father Chris Aylar, this can be done for people even after they've died, even years after they've died, because God exists outside of time. Jim Galgani begged our Lord to convert a terrible sinner, but our Lord refused. Finally, she said to him, Well, I am a sinner. You yourself have told me so, and that a person worse than me you could not find. Yes, I confess it. I am the worst sinner, and I am unworthy that you should listen to me. But look, I present thee another advocate for my sinner. It is thine own mother who asks you to forgive him. See, oh, imagine saying no to thy mother. Surely you cannot say no to her. And now answer me, Jesus. Tell me that you will save my sinner. And of course he did. God has left the question are many or few saved unanswered, and it is unanswered, regardless of what each side says. 
because if we knew for sure that very few our number are saved, it would cause despair and people would say, why bother and just give up on being saved. If we knew for sure the majority were saved, it could cause us to be laxed and perhaps miss salvation through neglect. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and pray for the salvation of those whom God has put around us because our prayers for them, even after they've died, can affect whether they go to heaven or to hell. There's a reason that you are the devout Catholic. There's a reason that you are the one who goes to Mass every Sunday and Holy Days of Obligation, like we're supposed to, and perhaps even daily Mass. There's a reason that you are the one who prays the Rosary and goes to Eucharistic Adoration, because you are called to pray and sacrifice for sinners so they'll be saved especially for the ones who've hurt you. Christ never said it would be easy. He just said it would be worth it. Until my next video, God bless.